this is going to be interesting. Now, you think all the things that have happened in your life, the first thing I have to say, now whether a person believes in God or not, it's totally up to them. I'm not going to dispute them on that. I'm not going to put them down or anything like that. But I thank God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <sighs> Multiple times a day, if I was given a second chance, grown children. Normally I'm an RN. Um, I had been for had been for 11 years but I'm on disability for about a year now. Um, they recently let me go because <laughs> they don't keep you on after um, a year of disability. Um, and I just I'm living with this illness sarcoidosis that I think people need to know a lot more about. What I have is something called sarcoidosis. You know, people say, sarcoidosis, what's that? Well, it's, people say, you know, sarcohootsis, sarcowatsis, sarcotusha, sarcoship, something all different. Don't worry, nobody says it right the first time. As far as I know, they categorize it as an autoimmune disease. Um, and the reason for that is because your body is somehow attacking itself. It's, it's seeing something that it doesn't like and it's forming what's what's called granulomas, which are um, a, a tissue, and it, it will often um, form mostly in the lungs, but it can be any organ of the body. Um, and in my particular case, it's my throat, although I have a feeling I've had it in other, issue, in other areas too, but it's never really been, been diagnosed there. Um, so obviously if you have um, these granulomas growing in areas that they normally wouldn't exist, it causes all kinds of problems. If it's in your lungs, you're having trouble getting enough air. If it's in your eyes, you're having vision problems. If it's in your heart, you're having you know, heart problems, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When people ask me, what is that? I say it's a multi-organ disease. Typically, it affects the lungs but I have neurosarcoidosis. It causes fatigue, um, low-grade fevers. For me, my balance is off, dizziness. When I first found out about sarcoidosis, what did I do? Boo! Google it! But as soon as the doctor said that word, I looked it up and learned a lot about it. And then, when I was telling different people about it, they said, oh yeah, I know so-and-so that has that, and, um, in fact, I know he was our minister when I was growing up. He died of sarcoidosis because it went undiagnosed. I had originally gotten kind of acutely ill, um, had really swollen glands, a sore throat, high fever, and didn't have um, swallowing or breathing problems that I realized and kept going to doctors, they kept thinking it looked like strep, I kept getting strep tests, they kept coming back negative, I'd go to more and more doctors all the time, and nobody knew what I had. Well, I got sick in July, July 21st, 2007. I remember the very day I got sick because I thought, oh darn, I've got the flu. I felt like I had the flu. And I waited a couple days and I felt lousy. So I went to the doctor and they said, yeah, you've got some kind of virus. Uh, give it a few days. So I gave it a few days, went back, and they said, oh, you have tonsillitis. Here's some antibiotic. And didn't get any better, kept running this low-grade fever. Um, went back to the doctor. They said, it's a virus. They tested me for Lyme disease several times, um, uh, mono, because my son had had mono, 
that year and they thought well possibly um, and they said well you'll 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 be fine but things kept getting worse I got the bio, the Bell's palsy on this side then they treated me for herpes because that's a side effect of herpes um, I knew it wasn't that because I continued having the low-grade fever even though the doctor said that's not really a fever you know but it wasn't typical for me they kept um, you know like I said doing the strep tests eventually when they couldn't figure out what I had they'd kind of go back to the old well you know it's in your head or you're a board housewife um, and eventually after five years of hearing that I just I didn't know what to do anymore and I kind of said to my husband you know if I can't find out what's going on I'm gonna have to go to a psychiatrist because this just can't continue and I had little kids at home and I, I couldn't take care of them I couldn't talk to them I couldn't read to them and so I actually got out a phone book and I closed my eyes and well I opened it to physicians closed my eyes took my finger and and just hit one and it happened to be an ear nose and throat doctor <laughs> by some miracle but um, when I went to see him here in Madison he came into the room my mom had to drive me because I couldn't even like turn my head to to drive at the time and be able to breathe it would close my airway off and he came into the room and he said, oh my God, he said, I could hear you trying to breathe through the door. And he said, you know, let's have a look right away. And um, he took one look and he said, I think I know what you have. I went to get a bronchioscopy done, I think, I think, and they cut the hole right up here and everything, did that, ran the thing down, got the sample and everything. He took it right down. The doctor took it. I asked him before though, how many have you done? He said, I've done about 300 of them. Okay, I just want to know, you know, what you've done and everything, just to be sure that you know, not your one of the first ones. And he said, oh, I've had all good success and everything. So they took, when I was on the table, they took the sample down to the lab to get it and everything. And that's when they came back and I was diagnosed then with sarcoidosis. At that point, he recommended me to see an uh, infectious disease doctor. So I did that. And he treated me, I believe he treated me for depression. He gave me the um, and antidepressant and told me to walk a half hour every day and I'd feel better in two weeks. <laughs> the fact was I could hardly walk and before I got sick I was going to the gym three four times a week. So my Bell's palsy this went away I got it on my other side of my face and I saw the infectious disease doctor he saw me and he said, Sam, I'm going to make a call to a neurologist. You need to see a neurologist. And that very day, they did a spinal tap, all kinds of tests, and kind of figured out that it was probably sarcoidosis, neurosarcoidosis. So they put me immediately in the hospital because they were worried about my airway and, and did the biopsy. And, um, came back that that's what it was. Which in some ways was, you know, it's good to not hear that word cancer, but at that time, I guess I had no idea what I was dealing with. Um, I lost hearing, my vision was bad. Um, the fatigue, my vision, hearing, dizziness, my balance was way off. I could not walk straight or without somebody's help. I have laryngeal sarcoidosis. And that's kind of funny that it's named that. One of my doctors told me that it's kind of a misnomer because it's called laryngeal, but it affects everything surrounding the entire larynx area, but it, it hardly ever affects the larynx itself. But um, one of my main symptoms was laryngitis just because it, um, it, it will cause swelling in the areas around the larynx so that your vocal cords can't move correctly. Um, I had swallowing problems, I had breathing problems, I um, 
when I was first diagnosed um, many years ago. It took me five years to be diagnosed and then I was immediately put in the hospital and um, when they did the biopsy I had to have a tracheostomy because the swelling was so bad at that point that the extra um, surgery for the biopsy made me not able to breathe. Well, I also had to see an ophthalmologist and she couldn't believe how bad my eyes were, so I was on a lot of different eye drops. And and then I was admitted to the hospital for, they did the, I had the surgery here to do a biopsy on my lungs. And then I also had the IV prednisone, um, pretty high doses of prednisone. And that's all they treat you with, prednisone. Lots of prednisone. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Very frustrating. Yeah, there is no treatment for something. No. Isn't. And I've heard of other treatments, but most doctors don't want to do it. After two years on the prednisone, he thought I was stable and I con continued on the prednisone. And then after being on it for, after the third year, I went into remission and was able to taper off of the prednisone, um, which was wonderful because it has nasty, nasty side effects. Um, and actually, um, I mean, there's no way to, to know how long it, for sure I was in remission, but I, it seems like it was at least over 13 years. Yeah, I think I was on 60 milligrams of prednisone. And uh, that is basically a steroid, which what it does is it allows the lung to breathe a little easier. So I did that, and then they tapered me off on the thing, uh, on the thing, and I went in what they call remission. This was back in '95, and uh, so I did that in remission or dormancy, whatever it is. And as people say remission, well, cancer people are remission, you know. Sarcoidosis, you're going to have that, just like a lot of other autoimmune diseases. You're going to have it in your body, and it's going to hide in little crevices and little things like that, and go, you know, come back and get you and everything. And so I was in res uh, dormancy and stuff like that excuse me, or remission, and that was from 95 until 2005. And almost like overnight, I lost 24 pounds. The most I've ever weighed in my life was 154, 55, you know, so it's close to there anyway. So I dropped down to 132 pounds and uh, something like that. And uh, so I'm going, whoa, what's wrong? Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I do wish more people understood it, stood sarcoidosis. You know, I have people that, you know, I might not have seen in a while. Oh, Mary, you look great. You must be doing great now. I was like, yeah, I'm doing good. But really, I feel kind of crappy. You know, it's one of those things that's like, well, you look good. You must not be sick. You know, maybe to understand a little more about that, that um, just because you look okay doesn't necessarily mean you feel so great, you know. It seemed like they thought I was pretending, I don't know, making things up. I mean, is that fun to, you know, be sick all the time? I don't think so. And I, I tried at first to really, to reach out to them and say this isn't right. And, and some people were very... Um, receptive and really did kind of you know turn it around and, and were very supportive but then other people still um, you know I'll see them and, and you know well how's it like to be off work and you know like I'm having this really fun time or something you know and, um, and the, the doctors throughout the years you know that would say you know it's all in your head or once, you know, like I got on the prednisone for a long time, a lot of people, it's kind of funny, prednisone either tends to, to make you lose weight because you're sick to your stomach all the time, or a lot of people get like this big appetite and you gain weight. And I actually gained a pound a week the three years that I was on it to begin with. I mean, I weighed 120 pounds when I first started on prednisone. So then you started to get doctors that would say, well, you're having trouble breathing because you're overweight. No, I'm not. 
we really would like to go ahead and put you on the transplant list, but you are so far gone that you might get the transplant and your life quality might improve, but we'd rather give it to someone else who could use it more to their advantage and we think their life thing would be a lot better. So, okay, no problem. Um, even though I had a diagnosis, no one knew what to do with me. You know, they just, um, I'd go to the ER and they would either act like nothing was wrong with me or that once they would look at my throat, they'd all be running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Oh my gosh, she's gonna stop breathing any minute. What do we do? And there was nothing in between. There was no, no plan, no um, common sense approach. Um, it's just either one or the other. And I, I had several different doctors and um, just was not getting any better and, and not getting good care. Um, the fact that I had to leave my job um, and stopped getting their insurance was kind of a godsend because they, um, the group cooperative that I belonged to, I had couldn't keep up those payments so I had to go to my husband's insurance and they would cover University of Wisconsin and so then I changed all my doctors and went there. Okay, now we see Dr. Cornwell. He tells us to go to bed and everything. We go back home and everything. So I'm waiting. I'm going to wait for about three weeks. I get a call on my voicemail. And it's from so-and-so here at the VA transplant office in Madison, Wisconsin. And they said, uh, we'd like this, I'm leaving Mr. Thomas Michael Kapler to give us the call. Now, you can either call us today or call us tomorrow. We'll be here for about another half hour. Two hours time difference. Quarter to two, which makes it a quarter to four back here. Now, the question I would ask a lot of people is, do you think I'm gonna wait until tomorrow to call them? No. And uh, as I told people, I said, there are basically two calls I wanna, I'm gonna, I'm looking forward to is one to come back. You're on a transplant, you're gonna get your transplant. And two is when they call you to get the thing. How I react to those, I don't know. But when I got the call to on the thing, I'm going, oh, geez, and tears, tears call. I, I'll admit that I shed a tear on the deal. So I call back and I said, well, this is Thomas Michael Capper and someone from the transplant office wanted me to call him. Oh, yeah, it was Tracy. Okay, Tracy. Tracy said, okay, Thomas? He said, yes. He says, we want you to come back to get an angiogram because I want to check one more time and dealing with my heart to make sure my heart was okay and everything because, you know, the pulmonary arterial pressure was jumping up and down, screaming off the paperwork and everything. And they, of course, they didn't know how long until they had me on the thing. And uh, we want you to stay. And I go, I'm going to stay for a transplant. Eau Claire is where I go for my neurologist, my ophthalmologist, and my pulmonologist. So 30 miles. And I have gone to Rochester, and that's about an hour and a half. I have a rheumatologist, a pulmonologist, a larynx specialist. Um, an internal medicine doctor is my primary physician and they all, since they're all in the same group, they all work together, they um, they just have really had my, my best interest at heart where I just felt like it was like almost a comedy with, with the other doctors I had, you know, kind of running into each other and not knowing what to do. And, uh, that's just such a good feeling to to feel like somebody's really, I mean, they keep telling me, you know, like we're on your team and, um, you know, they, they call me at home all the time and they, they tell me they're worried about me and they they talk to each other and they, um, I, it's just, it's been really nice. I was watching a soap, General Hospital. People say, oh, you want General Hospital? Yeah, I wouldn't have anything else better to do. I wasn't working. And uh, the Robin Scorpio at that time was talking to her husband and everything. And, she mentioned to him, and you should have seen the look on Dr. Maloney and Nicole's face when I said this. I told him that, and Chris was saying, oh, you want soap operas, oh, geez. So I said, yeah. And what it was said was, what Robin told her husband at that time, because he was a surgeon, neurological surgeon or something like that, I said, 
There are artisans and painters. One has a brush, one has a scalpel. One gets credit for the artistic work that it does, and one gets credit for the lives they save. Um, and, and it can be, like I said, such a long, terrible, tiring journey to, to find that team. I might cry, but I had to wrap my pea-picking brain around the idea of getting a transplant. I looked all sorts of things. There's all sorts of protocols, all sorts of things that people do and everything. And as people we've I've talked to, Thomas, who's doing the video here and everything, and other people is they you know it's a lot of I don't know you know the soft soul sales people, snake oil people, and things like that. Uh, that he. He claims to be a doctor. Well, he is a doctor, an engineering doctor. He got his PhD in engineering, but supposedly he cured himself of sarcoidosis. And there's another guy who took all the stuff and everything, and he's cured himself of sarcoidosis. But I met the one guy who did that, and he does look different. His lip and nose were big and all this other stuff, and he took it. Maybe it worked. But as I tell people, we are all different. I see a doctor in Hudson and it's for, it's called a NUCA, NUCA treatment, N-U-C-C-A, and she's a chiropractor, and it, it's, she is helpful. I, I was lucky enough to be able to start taking Remicade recently, um, which isn't approved for sarcoidosis yet, but a lot of people are starting to take it, and it's doing what it needs to do as far as keeping me from needing a tracheostomy again. But it's, it's not, I don't feel any more like myself. I don't feel any less fatigued. Um, so in one way it's working, and in another way it's not doing everything that I had hoped. And I also do Reiki. I have a place here in town where I get Reiki. And that helps. kind of helps with the pain and just... Even just accepting everything that's happened to me. Yeah, your emotional. Yes, part. yes. Yeah, so I do that. And I do see all my specialists in Eau Claire. I see them once a year now. So they got the lung coming here. They don't have anybody else who needs it. I'm on the slab getting ready to be sliced and diced. Okay, it's a crapshoot. Let's put it in and see if it works. Guess what? It's now almost two years. Next, the 9th, 118 in the morning will be two years post-transplant. Now, a guy on the Marshall Protocol who said, anybody who's ever had sarcoidosis who gets a lung transplant, the life expectancy is 18 months to two years. Well, I'm almost to two years. I'm looking at, when I got the lung transplant, I was looking at five more years better quality of life. If I could get that, five more years better quality of life, that's all I'm asking for. I've got almost two of them right now but I want to have this sucker come out to be maybe 20, 25 years. Get a hold of this dude if he's still alive and say, what did you say? Guess what? Neener, neener, neener. <laughs> 25 years. It's metal or plastic, um, or a little bit of both. They put a metal tube kind of shaped like this into your airway. And um, because you don't have a normal airway where you could usually, you know, like if you had phlegm or something and you would cough it up, it has to come out through the tube. And um, it seemed really daunting at first in the hospital, but I guess I handled it really well because um, the doctor at one point wanted me to talk to other people that might get them because I handled it well. Um, and I wasn't a nurse yet, so it just, um, you know, it just seemed comfortable to me. There was really no pain involved, which was surprising. And um, I, Stayed in the hospital for two weeks with it. They showed me what to do. I went home with um, a portable suction machine so that if you're not able to get this, your secretions out on your own, you use that to get, get it out. And that was that was the, probably the biggest relief is when I could finally do that on my own because um, when somebody else does it for you, they don't they can't sense how far down to go, and it can be really extremely painful if they get down into you know like lung tissue. So doing it myself, I could tell 
what I was doing and, and make sure that it didn't hurt. Um, and you could talk with this? At first, no. Um, I had to get to a certain point where the swelling was, was low enough that I could plug the hole at certain points and then you could talk around it. Um, so that was interesting. I cried like a baby because I did not want to be dependent on oxygen. But thank God I did depend on oxygen because there were times that I was in oxygen that I got liquid oxygen. Before I had the transplant, I was on liquid oxygen and everything, 24-7. And uh, I'd walk maybe 15 feet and I'd have to stop and rest. Instead of taking a shower, it was, I had oxygen blasting at about six liters plus, sometimes a minute when I was taking a shower. And I was like a hot shower. And it would just suck out that oxygen and make me just tired. So I ended up starting to do a sponge bath. And everybody knows what a sponge bath is. You wash your feet and you rest. You wash your calves and you rest. It take me about an hour to do a shower, to wash myself and bathe myself. So I did that. And uh, so I said, man, I just don't want it to be dependent on this and everything. And so I ended up getting on the thing and everything. And the people who delivered, I think they were in Cerritos, if I'm not mistaken, who delivered the uh, oxygen, incredible people, they would call me up. In fact, the guy, I was out of oxygen one time before real low, and I thought I was going to run out. And they, the guy from, before he went to work, brought me oxygen. Incredible in the people, I think of that. Um, so I did that, got that done. I've um, had to leave my job as a registered nurse. I um, spend a lot of time at home um, kind of doing nothing. I'm fatigued, I ache all over. Um, I don't know if it's a medication issue or, or the sarcoid affecting, you know, like neurosarc, but I've had a lot of issues with um, confusion what people like to call brain fog. Where normally I would be a person that would, I love to do crossword puzzles, I love to read. Um, when I first got seriously ill again a year and a half ago, I could not finish a page of a book to save my life. I couldn't concentrate long enough, it didn't make sense to me. I'd read the same sentence over and over again. Obviously I've had a ton, ton of doctor's appointments. I wish I, there's some way I could get all the time that I've spent in doctor's offices back because I know it would be so much time. Now because of sarcoidosis, it could go into any other organs. Present time, I still have it in the obstructed left lung. Right lung is done. If it goes into right lung, I have no idea. None whatsoever. Uh, I haven't got it in my eyes. It could go in my eyes. Again, it could go in any organ. It, your body is a massive organ, bone. Marrow, the bones, the neural sarc, the sensory of going into the brain and everything like that, uh, the eyes, the skin, liver, kidneys, your whole body basically it could get on. When I went back for rechecks, you know, like six months a year, that having a PET scan, they discovered that I have it in my bones too, my lymph nodes, and I do have nodules in my lungs too. So it's like, it's a bummer. Yeah, you have sarcoid. You know, a lot yeah, of it's kind of like systemic sarcoid, yeah. I guess I would say. So, I mean, I think it's been one of the hardest things for people that have sarcoidosis is that no one seems to quite understand. A lot of us have been very fortunate that we have spouses that see us every day and understand, but the people that don't see what you're going through every day. They just don't get it. You know, I, I just can't. Some of the things that have been said to me, <laughs> I just I can't even fathom that coming out of my mouth. But um, you know, other people <laughs> seem to have an issue with it. You know, I've been told oh, depression often goes with sarcoidosis or other rare illnesses. And someone told me, oh, I love life too much to let you know be depressed, like it was a choice. You know. You know, that's just not right. I, I, 
I just want people to, you know, I think that's what a lot of us want. And, and I think maybe that's partly why, you know, you feel like you want to have something out there about this is you just want people to understand. You know, you just want them to say, you know, I'm sorry you're going through this. Awesome. Aha, I gotta do this. I got them here. I take about 20 drugs a day, some of them multiple times. There's a lot of people who take a lot more. So what we have here, these are the drugs I take. Now, today I found out I've got three of them, which normally they get you off of after about a year, and they kept me on it for like two years. It's ethambutol and isoniazin, and then there is a B6, pyridoxine. I don't have to take those anymore, which is a good deal. And uh, the pyridoxine is one of those that, uh, or the isoniazin, I think it's the isoniazin, after you take it, just if you, you know, in the morning, it just really messes the stomach up. You just gotta go to the bathroom. So hopefully, I don't have to look forward to it. That's one of the side effects of it and everything. But I take those. Uh, if I wouldn't have taken those, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be dead. I'd known again people who didn't want to do something, didn't live up to what they were supposed to do, and they are no longer around. You know, at the same time that I was sick and having to leave my job, and they were threatening to fire me and were being very nasty about my absences, they had in the um, hospital newsletter this big thing about a woman who was battling cancer. And they were having fundraisers for her. And they were championing, you know, getting the rules changed so that if she missed work, it wasn't a problem. And making meals for her and taking her to appointments. Well, at the same time, I was getting shoved out the door and, you know, good luck, goodbye. What I used to do for work, I can no longer do. Um, I was a, a nursing assistant, and I worked at a, a nursing home here in town for 17 years, but then I had quit in February, February of 07, and started a new job immediately doing home health care, and I loved it. You know, I would drive, you drive all over the country to different homes and take care of them, and I just, I can't do it anymore. Um, the company I worked for were really good to me. When I was, they said, we're going to give you a leave of absence. Even though I hadn't worked there very long. They gave me two weeks. And I was sure I was going to get better. I was sure. I said, oh yeah, two weeks should be fine. <laughs> it wasn't fine. <laughs> no. And then at that point, they said that, you know, I would have to quit. And, um. And I, I can't do that. I just don't have the strength and the energy and the balance yeah. and the things like that anymore. Um, so that that bums me out. I miss that. I miss it a lot. And just doing stuff around the house. I don't do the yard work like I would like to. Um, it's been hard being home all the time versus going away and working eight hours a day and coming back. It's just a big change that way. But I think we've all adjusted to it. You know, my family, they've been great. They have been great. But it, it has been hard. It's changed my life. I'm one of the interesting people, you know, here. And when I came over from the UW side to the VW side, VA side and everything, people, I did my walking and stuff like that, and they said, What's your name, Thomas? Oh yeah, I, you're the one I've heard about. You know, again, they only gave me a week to two weeks to live. And so far, almost two years, I've, I've fooled them. And um, this is the first time in my life that things don't seem to be going according to any kind of plan. I mean, I've, I've never had to look for a job. I've never... Um, I mean, thankfully, the first time I was ill with sarcoidosis, I was an at-home mom, and it didn't seem like as big a change. This time, I'm kind of lost. A guy told me, I might have mentioned earlier, that he said, you know, you won the lottery. No, I didn't win no lottery. All I got was a second chance. Now we're going to get on my soapbox. I talked about how many people were on the national transplant list. 
waiting for transplants, some organ or whatever like that. And I hope, and I would get on my, I'll get out of camera thing, but I'd get on my knees and beg you, please put your name on the national donor list. But I'm okay. I have no, to because <laughs> if I sit there and feel right. sorry for myself, I'm going right. to be really, really sick. Yeah. You know, more mentally time is sick, yes. but I, I, I can't sit and feel sorry for myself. I mean, really, I'm doing better. I, I can walk. Think of the people that can't walk, that are in wheelchairs, you know. I don't have oxygen. There's a lot of SARC people that live on oxygen. Just so I'm all right, you know. My family's here. You know, they're good. I mean, but you do what you have to do. I mean, I'm sure you know. It's so many different things that you know. People say, you know, how could you be so brave, or how can you, you know, handle that? But I mean, if you want to live most normal life as you can, you you just have to do it. And again, I was given. I was blessed be given this second chance. So as I say, I have sarcoidosis. It does not have me. I will kick its ass. I refuse to lose. <laughs>